Hi, and welcome to this additional learning resource on fluid dynamics. My name is Ross Ward. I'm a Farnham Medical Engineering student, and over the following 10 minutes, I'll be taking you through an overview and explanation of fluid dynamic formula and their application. I hope that this resource will provide you with a better understanding of the basic principles of fluid dynamics, and ultimately, will better prepare you for applying these principles later on. Whilst we commonly use the term fluid to refer to liquids, a fluid is actually any substance which deforms continuously when subjected to shear stress. This essentially means that fluids are incapable of resisting shear forces applied to them. The nature of this deformation can be represented as theta equals dx over y. From the diagram on the right, you can see that in this case, theta is the deformation, dx is the movement of the fluid in a particular direction, and y is the perpendicular distance over which this deformation occurs. Furthermore, the shear stress acting on a fluid can be calculated as shear stress, represented in this example by the Greek letter tau, is, is equal to the viscosity of the fluid, shown here as the Greek letter mu, multiplied by the shear rate, the velocity change in the x direction, with respect to the distance change in the y direction. We can classify fluids into two different categories based on the relationship between its viscosity and shear rate. A Newtonian fluid is one where the viscosity is not dependent on the shear rate, and a non-Newtonian fluid is one where viscosity is dependent on the shear rate. We can further divide non-Newtonian fluids into three categories. Bingham plastics have a high yield stress. This means that they continue to act as solids until a high enough shear stress is reached. At this point, they begin to exhibit fluid properties. A common example of this would be mayonnaise. Pseudoplastics, or shear thinning fluids, are fluids where the application of shear stress results in reduced viscosity. This means that the greater the shear stress, the more easily the fluid will flow. Whipped cream and blood are both common examples of shear thinning fluids. Finally, dilatants or shear thickening fluids have a viscosity which increases with shear stress, making the fluid thicker as shear stress increases. Water soaked sand is a great example of a dilatant. You may notice that when you walk on wet sand at the beach, the area you stand on becomes more solid and creates a dry area under your foot. This graph provides a visual representation of the differences between each type of fluid. We will now look at fluid pressure. When considering pressure changes in fluids, you must remember that where gases are concerned, temperature will affect pressure due to the gas laws. In the following examples, to ease understanding, we will only look at ideal fluids. An ideal fluid is one that is non-viscous, incompressible and has no shear stress. It's important to note that ideal fluids do not actually exist, but considering a fluid ideal allows us to simplify the fluid dynamic problems. If we consider a large fluid body consisting of a number of individual points, fluid particles at a point which is low on the vertical z-axis will have a higher pressure than those at a position which is high on the z-axis. This is due to the additional weight of the fluid above it. As a result, we can quantify the change in pressure across the z-axis as the negative product of the fluid density, gravitational constant g, and the change in position in the z-direction. There are a number of ways we can measure the pressure within a fluid experimentally. We will look specifically at two different techniques. The diagram on the right shows a piezometer. This is a fluid filled vessel which is open to the atmosphere at one end. We can calculate the pressure at point A as follows. Since point A lies at the same vertical position as point 1, we can say that the pressure at A is the same as the pressure at point 1. We can then calculate the pressure at point 1 as the atmospheric pressure 
plus the pressure of the fluid above 0.1. The product of the fluid density, the gravitational constant, and the vertical distance between 0.1 and the surface. Alternatively, we can use a U-tube manometer to measure fluid pressure. We can measure the pressure at a point in fluid 1 by looking at the vertical height at which the meeting points for the two fluids sits. Often, fluid 2 is a dense fluid such as mercury. The balance point, represented here by the dotted line, is the point at which the pressures in fluid 1 and 2 are equal. We can calculate the pressure at point P as the pressure increase from the atmosphere by distance h in fluid 2 minus the pressure reduction across distance y in fluid 1. These are the principles used in blood pressure monitors. We will now begin to look at fluid flow. There are two ways to assess the flow of a fluid. If we consider a uniform pipe, the volume of a fluid flowing through the pipe each second would be equal to the cross-sectional area of the pipe multiplied by the average velocity in metres per second of the fluid as it moves through the cross-sectional area. This value is called the volumetric flow rate. We can also calculate the mass of a fluid that flows through the same pipe every second using the mass flow rate. Alternatively, we can use a U-tube manometer to measure fluid pressure. We can measure the pressure at a point in fluid 1 by looking at the vertical height at which the meeting points for the two fluids sits. Often, fluid 2 is a dense fluid, such as mercury. The balance point, represented here by the dotted line, is the point at which the pressures in fluid 1 and 2 are equal. We can calculate the pressure at point P as the pressure increase from the atmosphere by distance h in fluid 2, minus the pressure reduction across distance y in fluid 1. These are the principles used in blood pressure monitors. We will now begin to look at fluid flow. There are two ways to assess the flow of a fluid. If we consider a uniform pipe, the volume of a fluid flowing through the pipe each second would be equal to the cross-sectional area of the pipe multiplied by the average velocity in metres per second of the fluid as it moves through the cross-sectional area. This value is called the volumetric flow rate. We can also calculate the mass of a fluid that flows through the same pipe every second using the mass flow rate. Since the mass of an object is its volume multiplied by its density, the mass flow rate is just the volumetric flow rate multiplied by the specific fluid density. For energy to be conserved as a fluid flows through a pipe, there are a number of criteria that must be met. It must be an ideal fluid, the flow must be steady, there must be no external forces and it must be valid along a streamline. Bernoulli's principle is extremely useful in fluid mechanics. It states that for a non-viscous, non-conducting fluid flowing through a pipe, the pressure and velocity of the fluid are related. Bernoulli's principle is extremely useful in fluid mechanics. It states that for a non-viscous, non-conducting fluid flowing through a pipe, the pressure and velocity of the fluid are related, such that for the velocity to increase as the fluid flows, the pressure must decrease and vice versa. This is indicated in Bernoulli's equation, where the pressure plus half the density times the velocity squared, plus the product of the density, gravity and the height at one point in the fluid flow is equal to that of a second point in the fluid. Since pressure is equivalent to the energy per unit volume, we can say that the energy of a fluid is the fluid pressure multiplied by the volume of the fluid. This means that the total energy is equal to the sum of the pressure times the volume of fluid, half the fluid mass times the velocity squared, and the mass multiplied by gravity and the height z. We can use this along with Bernoulli's principle to calculate the energy loss between two different points. The energy loss, or head loss, is a rearrangement of these formula. I will go over this formula rearrangement more in the next slide. The energy loss, 
will be the difference between the energies at point 1 and 2, shown by the first equation. Since the volume is constant, we can eliminate it from the equation, giving us our second equation. Finally, we can divide through by the constant's fluid density, rho, and g to provide our final formula for the energy loss or head loss. I hope that you have found this additional learning resource enjoyable and useful, and that having used it, you will have a better understanding of the basic principles of fluid dynamics. Thank you very much.